I see a constant or increasing state of the threat. I see a constant or increasing availability of investigative resources. And I see a precipitous drop in sophisticated investigative activity. And I can't explain that. Because if you had and were able to do it throughout 13, 14, 15, 16, why aren't you doing it now? I'm Benjamin Wittes, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, October 25th, 2021. Pete Strzok is a former counterintelligence official at the FBI. He is the author, most recently, of an article in Lawfare entitled The Sussman Indictment, Human Source Handling, and the FBI's Declining FISA Numbers. It's an article that makes an interesting connection between a sentence in the indictment of Democratic lawyer Michael Sussman and some data on FISA applications released by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. They may seem unconnected, but Strzok argues, in my judgment persuasively, that there may be a deep connection between the two, and he joined me in the virtual jungle studio to talk about it. We talked about the anomaly of the Sussman indictment. We talk about how it was the tip of a very large iceberg of investigations of officials, agents, analysts who worked on the Crossfire Hurricane investigation. And we talked about the shocking decrease in the number of FISA orders issued over the length of the Trump presidency. It's the Lawfare Podcast, October 25th. Pete Strzok on declining FISAs and human source handling. Pete, this is an article that draws a apparently very odd and improbable connection. And I want to start by asking you whether you regard the connection that you've drawn in this article between the prosecution of Michael Sussman and the decline in the number of FISA applications that the FBI has sought over the last several years as a kind of hypothesis or whether you regard it with a good deal of confidence? I think it is certainly a hypothesis that is backed up by a limited data set. And what I mean by that is, I think, through conversations with any number of people who are, you know, either connected to or still in the FBI, anecdotal stories and a sense that folks are walking away from, in many cases, what used to be kind of bread and butter counterintelligence type investigations that are now seen as hazardous, um, hazardous personally, hazardous professionally. And that when I came across these numbers, that it provided a kind of very tangible data point to support that hypothesis in a much more rigorous manner than just, you know, kind of anecdotal stories from people on the inside. All right. So let's start with what you observe about the Sussman case, then talk about the numbers, and then come back to the Sussman case and talk about the connection between them. So first of all, you are are focused on an aspect of the Sussman case that other commentators, including me, have not focused on. So what is that? Well, so the at the heart, the Sussman indictment charges him with failing to, when, when asked, are you doing this on behalf of a client, essentially not saying to Jim Baker, who was the general counsel at the time, that he said, hey, I'm just here as a concerned citizen. And, uh, you know, a discussion for another time, which you've written about and many others have written about, this is a statement that is not backed up by any contemporaneous notes on the part of Jim Baker or recorded in a 302. And the best that the government seems to have is third hand notes from another individual who spoke apparently with Baker following that meeting. But the the indictment charges Sussman with with saying that he was there as a private citizen with concerns. But then the indictment, because it's a speaking indictment, which is a a kind of term of art, meaning that it is very, uh, it provides a great deal of information. 
in providing sort of a context to the behavior, does something really interesting, which essentially implies or directly states rather that Sussman not only didn't tell the truth when he was meeting with Baker about why he was there, but he also failed to disclose information, which the the argument appears to be on the behalf of uh, you know John Durham that this would have been relevant, that that it was material or or, or certainly was uh, important to the understanding of the information that Sussman was providing. You know, the concern is it's one thing if you lie. If I say you know the sky is green and it's material, and that that is you know clearly a false statement. The statute, the thousand eighteen U.S.C. one thousand and one, does include verbiage which makes it a crime to conceal or cover up. So there's an argument that material omissions are also false statements or can be false statements. But the tension is that when it comes to handling sources, human sources, whether it's a, you know, what the FBI would call a confidential human source, what the CIA would call an agent, that sources omit stuff all the time. I mean, that is just absolutely part of the game of intelligence collection. And so what's troubling, although this isn't the primary charge against Sussman, what's troubling in its inclusion in his indictment is that it points to a behavior that is really, really frequent within the U.S. intelligence community, certainly in the context of those agencies who recruit and handle human sources of information. All right. So help me out. Michael Sussman walks into Jim Baker's office, schedules an appointment, and drops off a set of allegations. In the FBI's parlance, what would he be considered? Is he a confidential human source? Is he a friend of the general counsel's who's giving a tip? What does the FBI consider somebody like that as? So I don't want to talk about Sussman specifically because I don't, you know, one, they're they're pinning criminal charges with regard to him. And, you know, I, I, I think it's what seems to me to be very clear and very public in terms of the reporting. I don't want to kind of confirm that because I just don't know what the government has or hasn't said in that regard. But I would say broadly, you know, the FBI gets information from all kinds of people. There are at one end people who are recruited sources, right? They, they're in a confidential relationship with the FBI. They understand that it's confidential. Uh, sometimes they're paid, sometimes not. They may do it for a variety of reasons, whether they are looking to get paid, whether they're doing it out of patriotic duty, whether they're doing it because they want, you know, some favorable treatment, whether it comes to immigration or, or whatever the case may be, but they are, you know, on the books. They, they are formal, numbered, admonished. What I mean by that is they're told, hey, look, you have a relationship with the FBI. It's confidential. If we pay you, you've got to report that as income. They're just a whole host of things that go into this formal relationship. But the FBI isn't limited to receiving information from sources. And in fact, on a daily basis, the FBI will receive information that is emailed in or you know communicated to the FBI's website, or people will call into a complaint number in a local field office, or you know a politician or a senator will run into some senior FBI executive and say, hey, I thought you should have this information. So you know, or a private attorney who is not a source could walk in to somebody, certainly like the general counsel of the FBI or another FBI agent and say, hey, I came across this information and I thought you should have it. That is legal. It is legal for the FBI to receive that information. And so the body in which the FBI will get information from people is very, very broad. And can you identify another situation in which somebody has been prosecuted for a material false statement for essentially not telling certain things, for giving incomplete information? Or is that anomalous in your experience? Well, it's certainly anomalous. I'm I'm not prepared to say it's never happened. But it is, again, in the context of the, the sort of prosecutive activity that the Department of Justice undertakes. It's uh, extraordinarily rare. And, you know, there, there are a variety of reasons for that. But the things that concern me are, you know, to the extent that it is rare, whenever you get to a point where there is some prosecutorial discretion about when something is rare, those times you do choose to prosecute it, that, you know, as a prosecutor, as the Department of Justice, that's something that you have to, to weigh very 
heavily. And some of that is the precedent you're creating. Some of that is past precedent and whether this would break from it. And then certainly some of it is the impact on the operations of the U.S. government. And that's what I, I, I try and unpack a little bit in the article. Sussman's indictment doesn't sort of stand alone in some isolated ivory tower of the past. This indictment is going on in the context of daily interactions between the FBI and the CIA and sources of theirs who are providing information. And the point I make is like, in, in many cases, like I, I can't tell you how many sources I have had that have withheld information or have shaded information or who play games. And every single person who has handled a human source and will tell you the same thing. And so for the government to sit there and say, okay, well, we're going to start, you know, making a practice or in one or two exceptions going to start prosecuting this behavior, it may help deter existing and future sources from withholding information. But I'm much more worried that a far more likely outcome is that potential and existing sources are going to look and say, oh, what the hell? I'm not interested in continuing this relationship with my friendly CIA officer or FBI agent, because the last thing I want to do, because we're playing this game that has been played for generations in human intelligence collection, but I no longer want to do it because suddenly it's clear to me that there are potential political vendettas that can be at play. And if I, you know, cross this line, I'm going to get prosecuted and I simply don't need that headache. And so that's on the source side. And then on the, on the, on the FBI agent, on the CIA source, your best sources are going to be people who are shady. You know, I make the point that, you know, good sources typically aren't angels. They're typically devils. And you want information about bad people. Who has information about bad people? Usually other bad people. So if you're in the streets of Islamabad as a, as a CIA officer, if you're an FBI agent, you know, in, in Detroit or Dearborn, Michigan, in, in an immigrant community trying to get to the bottom of the activities of the Islamic State, and you know that you are dealing with people who are, you know, not entirely forthright, who are frequently playing games with you, why do you want to go down a path where you are going to put yourself in a lot of, you know, under potential future scrutiny, and that the person sitting across from you is watching this trial on, you know, or certainly charges unfold in Washington, D.C., and say, all right, well, you're, you're promising me that, you know, you're going to work with me and you're going to keep this confidential. But, you know, how do I know in five years or three years if I, you know, fall afoul of the, the U.S. political winds that you're not going to be coming after me trying to prosecute me? And I'm really worried of the impact of that and that that is far greater from a negative perspective than anything positive that might come out of deterring future sources from not being completely forthright. All right. So a skeptical listener is going to have a lot of potential objections to what you just said. And I want to go through them one by one. The first is uh, a personal one related to you, which is they're going to say, hang on a second. Here's Pete Strzok making a high-minded sounding objection to a prosecution in which he plays some direct role in the events in question. So uh, let's deal with that. To what extent were you involved in the issues for which Michael Sussman is being prosecuted? Well, so, so in answer to your question about Sussman in a very limited way, after Jim Baker, my understanding is at some point met with Sussman, I went to his office, I think with somebody else, got the information that he had been provided and then took that to a, a different a colleague in a, a different division who ultimately, my understanding is, opened the investigation and looked into the material that Sussman had provided. So, you know, it was a transfer of custody of evidence that probably lasted, you know, not even two hours, maybe not even an hour, but it was, a, it was taking it from Jim walking down the hall and handing it off to a colleague. Were you ever substantially involved in the Alpha Bank investigation such as it was? No, not at all. I mean, that was very much, you know, there was something I remember hearing a briefing or two about and people have to understand. I mean, the the genius of the the narrative, the counter narrative that has been thrown out by, you know, partisans and, and folks with ulterior motives is that, oh, you know, look at look at Alpha Bank or, or look at Chris Steele and the dossier. 
but I, I, you know, sat in on a couple of briefings and heard sort of updates and, and kind of the final resolution of that look. But in my chain of command, I was not responsible or oversaw it. And you don't expect to be called as a witness in this in this trial to the extent it goes to trial. You know, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what uh, John Durham and his prosecutors are thinking. I know clearly, you know, my role, you know, was one of conveying it from Jim to the, the people who did the investigation. So, you know, if they need to establish that for some sort of chain of custody reason, I, I you know, I don't want to speculate. But, you know, beyond that, you know, there's nothing I'm aware of that would be relevant to the prosecution. And for your purposes, you have no idea, or do you, whether Michael Sussman told the truth to Jim Baker or lied in that meeting? Like your 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 point here isn't about whether he's guilty of what he's charged of or not. That's right. And and I don't I have no recollection of anything he might have told to Jim. So you know, if there's something discussed, I, you know, I have no recollection of that. And, you know, I, I think I would remember, but I, I don't have any recall of that. Okay. So next, the person will say, hang on, even if Pete played a de minimis inconsequential role in these particular events, and thus has no particular dog in the, is Michael Sussman guilty or innocent fight, he has a massive axe to grind on the larger question of retroactive accountability for the Russia investigation. He was criticized for text messages, of course, by the inspector general for which he was fired. He's been, you know, made famous in a negative way by some of the looks that have been taken by this in retrospect. And of course, to the extent that there is retroactive accountability through the Durham investigation, he's, uh, you know, potentially caught up in that. Uh, So why should we take him seriously in saying, hey, these investigations have real costs for the FBI? Isn't what he's really saying, these investigations are a pain in my ass? No, I don't think so. Look, I have a burning desire that the truth of what happened is accurately recorded in the history books. The fact of the matter is, you know, the IG looked repeatedly at not only my behavior, but the behavior of all the folks that were involved in this and found no indication that any of the decisions that we made or the steps we took were, they could find no documentary or testimonial evidence that anything was based on improper considerations, including political considerations. And you don't have to take the IG's word for it. There were multiple U.S. attorneys that looked at all of us. There were multiple congressional committees led by Republicans who looked at all of us. And I'm talking about every single email, text message, note, whatever the case may be. So, you know, I think to the extent there is criticism about what we did, it is not fair to say that there is any objective criticism that the work was done for an improper motive. I think, why should you listen to me? It's, well, because I was first, I was there. Two, I spent over 20 years doing a lot of the nation's most significant counterintelligence work. I'm not alone in that regard, but I certainly have a perspective that comes from having worked it. And I think if you hear people expressing concern about Trump and the past administration from a national security perspective, it isn't for nothing that everybody from General Hayden to General Clapper to, you know, Jim Comey to Andy McCabe to me to Mike Morrell to literally dozens of national security professionals with hundreds and hundreds of national security experience between them all said, you know, from both parties, all said the Trump and his administration presented a national security threat like no other in our nation's history. So I I understand people are going to try and look at this from a partisan perspective, but the best thing I can tell them is, look, look at the data that I put in this article. Look at the data that is coming out of a bipartisan Senate report. You can take the messenger out of the message, go and do the, you know, what's the phrase everybody loves now? Do your own research, right? Literally, go do your own research. Go to these reports and read them. And decide for yourself whether the, you know, don't listen to me, don't listen to some congressman, don't listen to left-wing, right-wing media. Go to these source documents and read them. 
And there's overwhelming, compelling evidence that there was an extraordinary national security threat from 2016 all the way through the last days of the Trump presidency. And frankly, it hasn't resolved. It's still there. All right. So third objection is Pete Strzok is very clever, but he's changing the subject. The subject is, you know, if the concern is, hey, you're reducing the incentive to engage in serious counterintelligence work because of possible political blowback and retrospective indictment, professional consequences, etc. The indictment of a source rather than of an agent or somebody actually who was doing counterintelligence work is actually irrelevant. You have an answer to that. It's kind of embedded in your piece, but I'm interested in fleshing it out. How does the prosecution of Michael Sussman for behaving in a squirrely fashion and withholding some part of the truth or the inclusion of that information in an indictment, how does that relate to the effect that you're concerned about, which is actually inhibiting the FBI's aggressiveness in counterintelligence matters? Yeah, so I think that goes to, to two things. One is the broader context of John Durham's work first. And the second is the broader context of how his work fits into the pattern of behavior by the Department of Justice in the White House over the past four years. And so, you know, as, as your listeners may or may not know, you know, this is where we're hitting the end point of Durham's work, I think. I mean, who, who the heck knows? It's been, you know, far longer than, than Special Counsel Mueller took for the entire pendency of his operation. But, you know, your listeners need to remember the early stages when, you know, Attorney General Bill Barr was making dark pronouncements about a terrible abuse of power by the government and it should never happen again. And the things that, you know, that, that the implication being that Durham and his, his work were going to uncover this malfeasance in the halls of power throughout the FBI and the U.S. intelligence community, all designed to, you know, delegitimize a lawfully elected president in, in just these years of dark tones and innuendo to in public pronouncements, including when the IG released his investigation, uh, the one looking at the kind of, among other things, the genesis of the Crossfire uh, investigation, John Durham doing something really almost unprecedented for a U.S. attorney in the course of an ongoing investigation to make a public statement that he disagreed with the conclusions of Inspector General Horowitz about how the case began. Well, you know, what does that mean? And how does anybody defend themselves against that kind of ambiguous statement placed in the context of the pronouncements of Attorney General Barr that there absolutely was just the devil in the senior, you know, the senior membership of the FBI and the CIA and elsewhere? And then the second thing is that, you know, as part of Durham's activity, yes, he's focused on Sussman now, but you've got to understand he was, my understanding, looking at everything the FBI did, traveling with Bill Barr overseas to our foreign partners, the British and the Italians, and trying to dig up dirt on everything the FBI and CIA had done. And so, yes, this Sussman indictment sits at the end of this path, but the beginning of this path represents just a deep dive into every little bit of behavior by those folks who worked on these investigations. And then the second aspect of that is Durham isn't the only thing that was going on during this time period. You had efforts by, again, multiple inspector general investigations, multiple congressional investigations on both the House and Senate side, bringing people in who the FBI had never agreed before or, or rarely agreed, folks at the non-senior executive service level, you know, GS-15s and 14s, and producing them to committees to be interviewed and, you know, under, in most cases, closed sessions. You had multiple U.S. attorneys that Bill Barr brought in, from Jeff Jensen to John Huber, that were going through and, again, looking through everything from the conduct in the Clinton Foundation investigation to re-looking the mid-year exam investigation, which was Hillary Clinton's, uh, the look into her use of a private email server, to, you know, whether or not the document production and things that were turned over as part of that were legitimate. So, again, if you are somebody on the inside, this represents years of just a constant recurring look at your behavior and what you did and whether it was proper or not and going through and explaining your notes and explaining your actions. And then finally, everybody, because the people who worked on this were really good. 
And that's one of the things that, you know, that, that disturbs me the most. There's been not a finger lifted on the part of the FBI or DOJ to defend any of the FBI's work in this regard. If anything, there's been, well, you know, Director Ray said, we're going to set up a group that's going to go through all the decisions made in the Flynn investigation. And that makes headlines. Well, I assume that's done. And yet not a word has come out about whether that was righteous or not. So all of this is going on in the context of investigators, agents, analysts, forensic accountants, computer specialists who are really extraordinary, who are really excellent at their job. And because of that, people in the organization know that, they know them, they respect them, and they are watching this top 5 10% of the workforce being dragged through hell for years. And so the question is why, <laughs> if this can happen to them, why on earth would I want to do anything that's going to put me anywhere close to that sort of white hot searing, politically motivated and focused spotlight on every last thing that I'm doing? How do you measure, how do you objectively measure the impact of that in the workplace? It's, it, it's likely impossible. That is going to be, you know, judging what motivates people and to the extent that it causes them to do or not do something becomes a very uh, probably impossible to know sort of thing. But I can tell you, I know, having spent a generation, more than a generation in the organization, the people who worked on these cases were uni well, nearly universally respected. They were viewed as high performers, great case agents, great analysts. And despite everything that's being spun about the deep state and you know the abuse and FISA abuse and no collusion and everything else, if you step outside of that and if you got into the FBI and into the CIA and other people who worked with the FBI and knew these people and said, what was your view of their competence and reputation? Almost to a man and a woman, you would hear they were extraordinary. They are extraordinary. When you, when you watch somebody like that being targeted and a group of people like that being targeted with absolutely no defense from the organization being pushed out and hung out to dry, it absolutely is going to have an impact on your workforce. All right. So I want to focus on the question of what the size of the group that we're talking about is. Because again, the person who's listening from the point of view of skeptical about Pete Strzok is going to say, Pete's here you know, talking about a group, but he's really making a complaint on his own behalf. And my question is, you know, for those who have read the IG reports carefully, it is clear that the group that you're talking about is significantly larger than this. How many people would you estimate have had their professional lives substantially negatively affected by having participated in Crossfire Hurricane? I would say easily in the dozens. And I say that in, your, in the context of your question of substantially negatively impacted. Adversely impacted, I'd say well over 50 or 60. But again, to the point of there, there's this common refrain to which Director Ray plays into that there's this small group on the seventh floor of the FBI who was doing all these things. And it, it aggravates me to no end when he's asked about that. And his, his kind of rote answer is, Congressman, Senator, you know, I've replaced my entire leadership team. Most of those people have either been fired or resigned or retired. Well, the fact of the matter is, if you look at particularly the crossfire cases, we, I and others, specifically made a point of bringing in people Carter Page was a case that was handled out of New York. George Papadopoulos was a case handled out of Chicago. There were multiple field offices, Washington field office on top of FBI headquarters, where you had agents and analysts and supervisors and their supervisors who were all involved. And nothing aggravates me more than to see that, oh, these decisions that were made in the context of the 2016 investigations were this little cabal sitting there at FBI headquarters. The fact of the matter is you had chains of command in three of the FBI's four largest field offices, all involved in directing and approving these investigations. So if you want to damn these investigations, you're damning a huge swath of the FBI's investigative and supervisory field personnel. And that's obviously nonsense because it's not damnable behavior. It is righteous behavior. And part of my aggravation with the existing 
you know, senior leadership of the FBI is not understanding that these cases weren't done by a small group of six or seven people. They were done by this much broader group who was doing very good work for the most part across, you know, a, a large number of different chains of command. And to, to sit there and try and minimize that and say, oh, that's all gone. That's extraordinarily politically expedient, but it's not the truth. And, and so that bothers me. But if we're identifying, if your point is that the handling of these cases has sent a chilling message to agents, supervisors about how to handle politically sensitive counterintelligence matters in the future, your point is that you're not just talking about you and Andy McCabe and Lisa Page and Jim Comey. You're talking about a group of dozens of people whose careers have been negatively impacted either by adverse findings or by serial involvements in investigations that, you know, went varying degrees of, of places over a long period of time. Is that fair? Yeah, that's right. And I think, you know, to pivot a little bit, that's what makes the, the, the second piece, these FISA numbers, so compelling because it, one, it's just kind of quantitative data. Uh, you know, it's, it's objective. It isn't, you know, based on, you know, somebody's perception or belief about something or, you know, my perception and perspective versus somebody else's. This is just kind of data that's there. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. You and I have been talking about this chilling effect. I want to say since around the time the Mueller report came out, when, tell me if I'm not at liberty to, to reveal this, but I, I don't think there's anything sensitive about it, in which you pointed out to me that there was reason to worry based on the text of the Mueller report that certain aggressive counterintelligence inquiries might not be being made because Mueller made clear in that report that they were not being done by his office. He was sending material of counterintelligence concern back to the FBI. And you were quite concerned that after what happened to the Crossfire Hurricane Group, people at the FBI would be quite inhibited from being aggressive in this regard. So this is, you know, three years ago now, I think, or two years ago. And you have been concerned about this for a while. You've not written about it until this week. So explain to me what changed that caused you to say, okay, I should be talking about this. The, the Sussman indictment being reflective of a much larger pattern, how did this FISA data provide evidence that your concern was correct? Because it rather starkly shows a plummeting number of sophisticated, the use of sophisticated investment techniques during the pendency of the Trump administration. And, you know, folks need to understand that, you know, a FISA, and what I mean by that is, you know, court authorized investigative activity by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court is the workhorse of the FBI's most significant national security investigations, both on the counterterrorism front and the counterintelligence front. It is the tool by which the FBI can monitor someone's phone calls, their emails, their text messages, go in and covertly search their home to their car, to their bank accounts, or, or whatever the case may be. So, when you look at that, it, those numbers serve as a really good barometer of what the FBI's investigative activity looks like in the most sensitive, in the most significant of their investigations. Every year, the Director of National Intelligence puts out a statistical transparency report where they talk about a lot of the sort of investigative techniques used by the intelligence community. Included in that are what they call FISA problem cause targets, and that's to differentiate the techniques that require a problem cause standard versus lesser standards for things if you're getting business records or stuff like that. It's for the entire intelligence community. So it's not just the FBI, but the FBI is a significant player within the U.S. government's use of FISA probable cause orders. And when I was looking at this data, I use it to, I use the report in a, in a class I teach at Georgetown University, try to, to both 
convey what various national security tools and techniques are and to give the students an idea of the volume of activity that the government does in this regard. You know, it's not 30, it's not 40,000. It's, you know, kind of typically, you know, somewhere between, you know, one or 2,000 in the case of FISA's every year. And as I was looking at this year's number, the first thing that leapt out was an extraordinary drop. I mean, it was down in, in calendar year 2020, the total number of FISA orders was stood at 451. And, you know, depending on your political persuasion, you might say, God, that's, you know, 10 times too many, or, you know, you might say we need about 40 times more than that. But that number, what makes it so extraordinary is when you back up and you start looking at the time, you know, 2013, 14, 15, the average hovered somewhere around 1600. So, you know, this is fully a quarter of that. And so when I went and I looked, I said, well, that's, you know, what's, what's kind of tricky is that this year's report only goes back to calendar year 18. But then if you go to last year's report, it goes all the way back to 13. And if you look at the data, you see sort of a moving average of 15, 16, 1700. And then all of a sudden, when you get to calendar year 17, it starts to plummet. It goes from, you know, roughly 1500 to 1400 to 1200 to 900. And then all of a sudden, 500 last year. All right. So wait, let, let's let's talk about that. 2013 to 16, I'm going to be, I'm going to estimate these based on what you just said. I don't have the data in front of me. You have roughly 1,500 FISA applications based on probable cause per year. Orders. Now, my, everything orders. we know publicly is that, you know, there's close to a one-to-one -one ratio of applications to orders, but these are orders. Right. So we, we can assume that there's somewhere in the neighborhood of that many applications each year. My recollection is that number kind of peaked in the 2007, 2008 range when it was somewhere over 2,200 or something. So even that was down a bit from where it had been at the sort of height of the war on terror. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. But it was relatively stable, you're saying, at, at that point. Yeah, absolutely. And so you see between 2013 up through 2016, you know, 13 was the high at that point at about just over 1,700. But then 14, 15, 16 kind of hover right around 1,550. And again, you know, if you looking and you say what changes, well, you know, we're, we're getting further away from 9-11 is one thing. But what's really interesting when it starts to drop, again, starting in calendar year 2017, and a, you know, sustained precipitous drop is all of this kind of behavior and activity that I, you know, point out in the article, and we just talked about earlier, that this sort of attack on the FBI and this notion that, you know, there's FISA abuse going on, and some of it, you know, look, there were problems. The inspector general came in and looked at the one, one well, the only FISA that for the Crossfire Hurricane series of cases was targeted towards Carter Page. And there were significant problems with the FISA. And when, you know, particularly in terms of, you know, the, the accuracy of information, information that was maintained in this something called a Woods file, where you're supposed to document every factual assertion you make in, in an application or in a renewal. And there were problems there and no question about it. And the IG found them. And then from that said, well, you know, is there another issue, a broader issue in the FBI? And they went out and did, I mean, a, a much higher level, less rigorous, less deep sort of look at the FBI's FISA procedures and Woods file procedures writ large and found that, you know, this Carter Pages was not an isolated issue. There, in fact, were a lot of things that they pointed out. They put out like an interim bulletin, I forget what they termed it, uh, and a final report that pointed out a lot of issues. So there is clearly was a need to tighten up and correct some of the process to the FBI's applying for and conducting FISAs. But the issue isn't if there's a problem to stop doing something because it's problematic. The answer is if there's a problem with something, fix the problem and continue doing it, but do it in the right way. Let's isolate the effect first and then go back and talk about what possible explanations there may be for this effect other than Donald Trump. So the effect is we have a roughly 1,500 fluctuating average up through between 2013 and 2016. And then you start this 
a pretty awesome drop. It's declining literally every year, 2017, 18, 19. It goes down to 907. And then in 2020, it goes down to 524, which is somewhere between a third and a quarter of, depending on the year, of that kind of moving average. So your hypothesis is, look at this next to the Sussman indictment. They've been so aggressive in this retroactive accountability stuff that they're indicting sources for, you know, omissions of a type that seem or or dis, it's not the specific indictment is for a lie, but they're including in the indictment omissions of a type that are perfectly normal for sources to engage in in your extensive experience with confidential human sources. In that background, with this giant series of investigations that's negatively affected the careers of dozens of people, you would expect to see, and having predicted that this was going to have an impact on aggressiveness with respect to counterintelligence, this is now some vivid evidence of that timidity, that that induced timidity. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, that's right. I think that is the the point I'm trying to drive home. Certainly, you know, we have to note 2020 was the the height of the impact of the uh, COVID pandemic. But what's interesting is also in the report they note the number of national security letters, which are kind of the national security equivalent of a subpoena. It's not an exact analogy, but it's close. When you look at the FISA numbers, they drop but not nearly at the same rate as the FISA numbers do. So what that tells me is, yes, the FBI's work, the intelligence community's work was impacted, but they were still working, right? The national security letters are still getting issued, are still going out, and where you see maybe a 20% drop for NSLs, it's nothing like the 60% drop that you see in the FISAs. And in my mind, the only, the, the, the only difference there is a concern by people that they are going to get drawn into something that is going to put them at personal and professional risk because all the scrutiny that's being paid to the process. And that becomes a leadership issue. The FBI was doing all these FISAs because there was a legitimate national security purpose to do them. You know, people might argue, oh, you know, there's a handful never should have been open. Fine. I will. I will. I think that's less than 2%, but I will grant you 10, which is wildly over the top. That let's just say for the sake of argument of those 1,500, 150 were marginal and shouldn't have been done. I believe it's far less than that. I think 15 or less were arguable, but let's, I'll give you 10%. If you take that away and strip that out, there's no explaining how the national security threat that would merit 1,300 orders a year suddenly is sufficiently being addressed by 500. All right, let's talk about alternative explanations. So COVID, you're willing to grant that the number in 2020, which is really, really low, is probably lower than the effect that you're describing because it's exacerbated by COVID. Is that fair? Yeah, that's fair. That's right. And then so to that, then you say, okay, well, let's look pre-COVID and you look at at calendar year 19 and that's still at, you know, 900. Right. So it's still at half the level that it was in 2017. So let's split the difference and say that 525 or 524 in 2020 should really be 750 or something. Here's another possible explanation that I think maybe the inspector general, if he were here, would embrace, which is, yes, Pete is absolutely right. I came in and I applied a fine tooth comb to the really sloppy manner in which the FBI was conducting FISA requests and putting applications together. And the FISC itself got alarmed and you know, got Lawfare contributing editor David Chris to make a series of recommendations. The FBI adopted a whole lot of changes and imposed a certain amount of rigor. And 
you know, gosh, it's actually uh, harder to do the job if you do it really well. And so, yeah, maybe there's, uh, we threw out a little bit of baby with bathwater, but actually what you're seeing here is the effect of not of intimidation or people being afraid to do counterintelligence work, but it's actually the effect of insisting that people be more rigorous with what they're presenting to the court. Yeah, I don't think that's right. I think when you look, the, the, the critical issue with that perspective or that question is within the IG's review, how many FISAs were found that after their look were determined that they would not have had sufficient probable cause to cause an order to be issued? Now, in the, in the criminal context of the Title III or search warrant or something like that, you could have what's called a Franks hearing where, you know, the judge, the court would sit there and say, okay, if we take out the bad information, the inaccurate, the incomplete information, and we look and we take this other information independent of that, would there have been sufficient probable cause to cause the warrant to be issued? That, I think, the key question is, of everything that the IG looked at, how many things did they say or did the government acknowledge we didn't have enough problem cause to go up on this on this FISA? And the answer is, I think, less than 10, maybe less than five. No, no, the answer is none. Well, I'm looking at Carter Page, so the government did acknowledge, the FBI said, we do not, so there was the initiation, the initial order on Carter Page, and there were three. Right, right, so I was excluding Carter Page because that there was a separate specific right. finding on it. But look, here's the point with Carter Page. Everybody says, oh, it was a, it was a bogus FISA. No, it wasn't. The government, I think, took no position on the fact of whether the initiation in the first renewal had sufficient probable cause. And they said the second and third renewals did not. And therefore, we're going to, you know, we're going to isolate everything. But they didn't take a position. Now, I think that was, you know, my opinion. I think there was certainly probable cause. My experience with FISA's and the standard and what constitutes probable cause in a national security context, I'm very comfortable that even if you, I'm not even saying caveat and the heck out of the steel information. But if you take the steel information out of the picture, I believe there would have been enough that we would have gotten sufficient problem cause to get a FISA on Carter Page. Okay, but let's let's leave Carter Page aside okay. for a minute. In, in the IG's recent report... So the point is, but the IG is not finding, gosh, FBI, you did all these FISAs and you didn't have sufficient problem cause. The IG is finding, you did all these FISAs, you had righteous sufficient probable cause to get them, you just made a lot of mistakes that are really sloppy and unacceptable. Right. But my point isn't that the, you know, the FBI is like we're washing out FISAs that were unsupportable. My point is that if you actually do the work to document the Woods files, if you actually do the work to check every fact so that you don't have any of that sloppiness, it takes a lot more time. It takes a lot more energy. And that actually, that energy expenditure may be the, rather than the intimidation factor, may be the explanation for the decline in numbers. No, I don't know if that's right. I, I think, look, my, my experience is that, that the, the rigor that is needed and should be brought to every FISA process, whether it's the, the, the agent or the affiant at headquarters or the supervisors of those people, the fact of the matter is most of the FBI's FISAs are done completely and done well. You know, there, there's always a tension between, you know, go out and be aggressive and turn over every stone. And so you're running and you tend to, you know, you can either be rushed or or, you know, pulled in all different directions. And then somebody, you know, something happens where there's a big, you know, inspector general report and people go back to basics, but it is not having, again, done many, many, many FISAs. It is not an unreasonable burden for an agent or investigator in the field and his or her supervisor, both in the field and headquarters to put together a FISA application, to do it properly, to document it accurately in the Woods file and to go through and do it. So I don't, I don't think this is a function of like, oh my gosh, this has suddenly become so much more onerous. We just simply aren't going to do it. I think this is why, what is the expectation of what I'm going to get of and from this based on the, all the chance that I'm going to get pulled into all these inspections and reviews and second guessing, you know, particularly if I'm working on something very high profile. All right. Third possibility is that you're right. And there is some understanding, either explicit or just internalized by people, that 
you don't go with uh, ahead with a FISA unless you're sure. You don't even bring it to your ASAC, and you certainly don't let the Justice Department think you're working on one until you know you've dotted every I and crossed every T. And that that's a good thing, not a bad thing, because you know in the post nine eleven era, you guys were doing too many FISAs. I suspect a lot of our listeners who are sympathetic to the Russia investigation may actually have, you know, a a general sympathy to the idea that our surveillance tools are overused. Why is the right number of FISAs the number that we were doing in 2013 and 2014? Maybe the right number is the number if you intimidate a bunch of FBI agents and say, hey, you know, we're going to get you your FISA, but don't bring us shit with mistakes. Why is the right number normatively the 2013-14 numbers rather than the 2018-19 numbers? And that's a great question. And I think the way I'd answer that is that my experience in the counterintelligence arena is that we were always resource limited in the work we were doing. And what I mean by that was that the threat was greater than the resources that we could bring to bear on the various things that were on the FBI's plate. And an interesting piece of data to look at is the transparency report also breaks out the breakdown between, of all those FISA numbers, how many are US persons and how many are foreign. And as it turns out, usually under 20% typically are US persons. So what that tells you is by far and away, the bulk of what the FBI uses FISAs for are against people who aren't U.S. persons, who aren't U.S. citizens, who aren't permanent resident aliens. And in the counterintelligence context, without getting into anything classified, that typically points to people who are intelligence officers, whether they're stationed here undercover as diplomats, whether they're traveling into the country, whatever they may be that that host of people from places like Russia and China and Iran and Cuba and any number of hostile foreign nations and not so hostile foreign nations are on the FBI's radar because of the threat they pose to US national security. And historically, that number, I'm gonna be careful how I say that, the safest way to say that is historically, the threat that we faced was greater than the number of resources we could place onto it. And so when I see that at some point we were carrying 15, 1600 FISAs a year consistently, and we're able to sustain that and enough investigators to work those cases. And we were doing that in the context of if we had more resources, we would have more FISAs. Well, we didn't lose resources. We have the same number of agents and analysts has probably even gone up. And so when I see that the resources have stayed the same, The threat has probably gotten greater, but certainly hasn't decreased. But yet when I see this drop off of investigative activity, that's deeply troubling because that threat hasn't gone away. The the, the war on terror has not ended. The threat from foreign intelligence services suddenly didn't stop in the Trump administration. And so I see a constant or increasing state of the threat. I see a constant or increasing availability of investigative resources. And I see a precipitous drop in sophisticated investigative activity. And I can't explain that because if you had and were able to do it throughout 13, 14, 15, 16, why aren't you doing it now? Was it actually not important back then? That's not my experience. So then what's causing that drop? And what is the impact on the, in my, you know, what I'm thinking about, What is the impact on the FBI's ability to understand what is going on by those foreign intelligence services within the United States? And I think it is necessarily diminished when you don't have those investigative techniques at your disposal to get you that information. There's one other piece of this puzzle that we haven't talked about. We've talked about the group of people that these investigations have impacted and in a sustained way. We've talked about the evidence that there is some chilling effect. 
But, you know, without asking you for any confidential conversations, you are in touch with a lot of people in the Bureau who do these investigations for a living, many of whom used to work for you. One thing I would expect, if your thesis is right, is that morale in the counterintelligence world is low. Is it? Not as low as it was. (laughs) Again, I, I want to be very careful because I don't speak for the counterintelligence universe. You know, the people I know and who know me, you know, we have a common background. We have typically long professional interactions with each other. And I want to, you know, try to be very objective and take me and my experience out of it. I think it is absolutely fair that certainly, certainly prior to, you know, this year, there is a tremendous sense of concern about doing anything that would approach the political environment. And by that, I mean cases related to anybody in the administration, certainly within the White House, certainly with regard to Russia, that there was a voiced sense of trepidation to go after complex investigations involving Russia and the White House. Now, I want to caveat that heavily. I'm not in the FBI. I don't have the data. You might speak to somebody who, you know, is at a senior leadership role within the counterintelligence division of the FBI who would say, well, actually, that's not accurate. You know, we have cases here, 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 and here. But at least what I can say from hearing on the ground, I don't believe that to be the case. You know, hopefully that's changing, but That's what makes this data so alarming. The numbers, we'll see what 2021 brings, right? But with such a precipitous drop in the FBI's investigative activity, that's what, again, to your point you made earlier, it was this data that drove me to write it because I feel very uncomfortable presenting my anecdotal evidence as some sort of actual, you know, accurate information. But when you get information that is, you know, these, these numbers, which are, inarguable. I mean, they are what they are. And exactly what your anecdotal experience would have led you to expect. Yes, it, it, it exactly overlays exactly the same way with the anecdotal experience that you know I've seen and heard. We're going to leave it there. Pete Strzok, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Ben. Great to talk to you. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Our audio engineer this episode is Kara Schillen of Goat Rodeo. You need to do your part to promote the Lawfare Podcast. And if you've heard me say this this many times and you haven't done it, just go do it. Leave us a rating or review wherever you found us. Buy our merch at thelawfarestore.com. Share us on all the socials. You know the game. The Lawfare Podcast is produced and edited by Jen Patya Howell. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. And folks, you can become a material supporter of Lawfare. It doesn't violate the material support statute. At patreon.com slash lawfare. That's patreon.com slash lawfare. And as always, thanks for listening.